tropes. They exist everywhere you look in anime, and while some people might love them, others definitely don't. Now, the reason that people fall out of love with tropes is for a couple of different reasons. One, they're done too often, or two, they get kind of dated. There was a show in the 50s called The Honeymooners where the main male character threatened to punch his wife so hard she went to the moon and it was a quip and everyone said it. Basically, anytime she did something out of line, he was like, to the moon, Alice. And we don't do that anymore because the idea of punching a woman so hard she leaves the atmosphere every time she messes up got a little dated and anime is not immune to getting dated obviously within the anime world we're willing to accept a lot of things we wouldn't accept if it was live action but still if you hit me with enough tropes in anime i'm gonna start to feel their age a little bit and there's no trope to me at least as i've grown as an anime fan that has begun to feel more dated than your pervy character your perpetually pervy older man who's always trying to catch a look at all the local women peeping toms drilling holes in the side of a sauna so they can watch the girls bathe men who live their entire lives with one distinct purpose and that one distinct purpose is catching a glimpse even those have begun to grow as an anime fan this trope feels a little dated and it kind of takes me out of the love for a show it doesn't mean that there isn't some incredible characters who had pervy tendencies. In fact, some of the most widely recognizable and widely beloved characters in all of anime fall under this trope. Characters who completely change the dynamic of the show and for the better, you know, just when they're not committing misdemeanors. And today, I wanna to talk about those characters. Characters who were so incredible that they managed to overcome what would be considered a, a pretty glaring character flaw. And while I would love to sit here and rank and explain them simply based off of my enjoyment of the character or what they meant to me when I was growing up, I know what does well in this page. And therefore, today, we're gonna to be talking about the top 10 strongest pervy characters all gonna tie back in to how hard you punch you and if you love the idea of me talking about characters i love or hate from anime you're gonna love my anime podcast we talk as anonymous where me and danny mata break down everything that happened in anime this week it's available on youtube spotify and apple Podcasts. listen you can definitely be more than just one thing in this life in fact you can be hundreds of thousands or millions of things in the span of one lifetime you can be a monk one day and an exotic dancer the next you never have to stick to one thing in this life that's the beauty of human existence. And because of that, you can be more than one thing simultaneously. You can be kind-hearted and selfish simultaneously, secretive, but gossipy. And you can definitely, at least in the world of anime, be both perverted and strong. And thus today, I've compiled a list of 10 characters from anime who fall under this categorization. Characters who I wouldn't let anywhere near my girlfriend or children or dogs, but also wouldn't want to get in a fist fight with. And while on this list of 10 characters are some of my least favorite characters in all of anime, it's hard for me to deny their strength. So with no further ado, let's get into ranking and explaining the top 10 strongest perverts an anime. And coming in at number 10 on this list, but number one in my heart of characters I hate the most in anime, we have Mineta. Mineta is part of Deku's class at MHA, being in class 1A. Mineta takes the pravity to a level that honestly, if we were ranking on perviness alone, he'd probably be in the top two or three on this list. He is so infamously pervy that every girl in his class hates him and most of the boys also dislike him. Regardless of the circumstance, if somebody's talking to him or he's talking about something else, he's gonna bring it back to some lewd thought. In fact, the only reason that he wanted to become a hero in the first place is so he could be popular with women, which is technically the reason we got Kiss, so I can't really fault him for that. However, Mineta's perversion making him unpopular flies directly in the face of his true core want to be popular. And therefore, at an incredibly surface level, Mineta actually represents a dichotomy between wanting to be popular but not having the personality to be popular. Now, this isn't to say that Mineta doesn't have the occasional saving grace moment. In the provisional license exam, he had a heroic moment against Miss Midnight, which is pretty much the worst person to put up in a battle against Mineta. And in the war, he pled with All for One to take his quirk as opposed to another one of his teammates, which would have ended his career as a hero. But Mineta failed to realize that nobody wants his quirk, which brings us to the power segment of Mineta. See, Mineta comes from a pretty weak universe, the My Hero Academia universe. Even though things have begun to scale pretty uncontrollably in the manga, Mineta is still represented by the early days of MHA's power. And even amongst his peers in a weak universe, Mineta is by far and away the weakest and the most useless. See, Mineta exists more as a gag character who was given a gag quirk, a gag quirk that allows him to pop sticky balls off of his head. Now, Mineta is able to do with these pop-off balls about anything you'd be able to do with 
large wads of gum. He can throw them at people and have them stick them to a wall. He can make a chain of them to use as a pseudo weapon, or occasionally can throw them on the ground and use them as mini trampolines to increase his movement speed. And somewhat surprisingly, Mineta is actually one of the smarter people in MHA, placing ninth on the midterms out of all of UA, and also receiving an A in intelligence in his MHA official stats book. And honestly, he needs this intelligence because his quirk, once again, is useless. However, his intelligence has allowed him to figure things out like his ultimate moves, like Grape Rush, which is running at somebody while throwing a bunch of his pop-off balls at them, which immobilizes them so we can get around them, or Grape Buckler, which has him building a shield out of his Grape Balls that allow him to block any incoming projectiles and also stick to anything he hits. However, regardless of how intelligent Mineta may or may not be, when you're three foot tall, your quirk is Thicky Balls, and you're built like a bowling pin, you're not going to be that high on this list. Which is why we're moving on to number nine. Zenitsu. Now, there'll be some people here that rally against the idea that Zenitsu is a perv. You'll say that Zenitsu doesn't exist in the perv trope, he exists in the simp trope. And regardless of whether you may or may not be correct in that assumption, I would argue that anybody who throws themselves at the foot of a woman and begs them to marry them, even though they've never met the woman, is a perv. Sure, there's no oogling, fondling, or overtly lewd thoughts, but at the end of the day, he is making women very uncomfortable. And that's kind of the most important thing. Now, the reason that Zenitsu is the way that he is is because he believes he doesn't have long to live. Zenitsu believes that his job as a demon slayer will take his life at a young age, and therefore he has to hurry up and get married and live with a woman so that he can enjoy life as much as possible before his early death. And in fact, really the only time that Zenitsu is not being an obnoxiously loud coward is when he believes he's hitting on women, as he steps into his wannabe womanizer side personality. However, there is nobody he wants to womanize more than Nezuko, who he is very publicly and loudly obsessed with. Now, Zenitsu, while he does technically still exist on the same list as people like Mineta, is a much better character. He goes through a progression, a character arc. He goes through development. And sure, there's still a part of him that lives deep inside of him that will throw himself at the feet of any woman he finds attractive and beg them to marry him, but that is simply a quirk in a much larger personality. And since we're talking about Mineta, Zenitsu's powers are also much larger than Mineta's. See, Zenitsu uses Thunder Breathing, but only the first form, Thunderclap and Flash, and technically the seventh form, which was created by him, but that's kind of a spoiler, so I'm not going to super go into it. Zenitsu has three different applications of Thunderclap and Flash, Sixfold, Eightfold, and Godspeed. Now, with Sixfold and Eightfold, this is just Zenitsu using Thunderclap and Flash either six times or eight times in a row. However, Godspeed is different. It's the highest application of Zenitsu's demon slaying technique. This technique has Zenitsu channeling all of his power into his incredible incredibly strong legs, which allow him to increase his speed far beyond a regular thunderclap and flash. And while when we see it for the first time in the Entertainment District arc, Zenitsu says that he can only use it twice in a day, by the time the final arc rolls around, Zenitsu is able to use it much more than that. Now, Zenitsu is fast, and he's only getting faster. While Zenitsu used to have to be asleep to access his thunderclap and flash or any of his thunder breathing techniques, as he progresses and becomes more serious and more talented in his techniques, he's able to use them while awake. And it gets to the point with his techniques that eventually he finds himself against a demon who's able to use actual lightning. And if you remember what the mangaka of Demon Slayer told us is that those who use thunder breathing or flame breathing aren't actually making either thunder or flame. However, this demon is able to generate actual lightning with their blood demon art. Something that Zenitsu is not only able to dodge, but also to out pace, making Zenitsu, who's not actually using lightning, the speed, if not greater than the speed of lightning, which is about 270,000 miles an hour, which when compared to the 670 million miles an hour that light moves at isn't all that impressive, but when compared to Mineta is very impressive. But can a character be both detestable and likable? See, Zenitsu exists in this middle ground where there's characteristics about him I don't like, but there's also characteristics about him I do like. I wouldn't go nearly as far as to call Zenitsu detestable, and therefore I would say that Zenitsu was a somewhat likable character. Well, with Mineta, I could not say the same. He is fully detestable, and I don't like him. But can a character be both fully detestable and likable? Well, I would say yes, because coming in at number eight, we have a character that I fully acknowledge is fully detestable, but also love. And that character would be none other than the incredibly prolific 
Hisoka. Now listen, technically a fight between Hisoka and Zenitsu would be pretty close. Zenitsu was massively hypersonic while Hisoka floats somewhere around high hypersonic plus. But the intellect, attack potency, and straight up unkillability of Hisoka put him above Zenitsu for me. See, Hisoka in all senses of the word is an enigma. His character, his personality, his entire power system are shrouded in a coat of mystery. But one thing we do know pretty concretely about Hisoka is that he's a creep. See, Hisoka is a perv in a way that we haven't really covered yet. And that is that he's very attracted to potential. And while unfortunately his attraction to potential tends to manifest in him oogling little boys, it's not that he's into little boys, he's into what they might become one day. Why do I sound like I'm defending him? See, we've seen multiple times from Hisoka that he gets uh, uh, excited when Gon shows a lot of potential. And sometimes when he's with the likes of Gon and Kiloa as they're exhibiting massive amounts of potential, I, he, he looks at their butts, which is really bad, and I fully condemn that. But as a character, pretty much every single other minute, he's not doing something salacious and gross. He's really awesome. He's mysterious. He's got like a whole Joker vibe. He's got bungee gum. He's really smart. He's also like weirdly attractive. So he exists in this incredibly uncomfortable middle ground of being a cool character who does really uncool things. But at least his strength is concrete. It's infallible, if you will. See, understanding Hisoka's strength is kind of difficult because he's never fully trying. Well, we've seen him fully try once, and that was in his battle in Heaven's Arena against the likes of Krolo, which Hisoka does technically end up losing, but only because Krolo prepared for the fight for weeks and stole multiple abilities from members of the Phantom Troop and other incredibly powerful hunters, while Hisoka didn't really do anything. And therefore, one could very easily make the argument that Hisoka could defeat a Krolo with no prep time, which is insane when you consider the fact that Krolo pretty much stalled two of the strongest Zoldic members in history, with Zeno being fine giving up his life to take out Krolo. And while Hisoka has his intellect to thank for a large portion of his strength, probably having the highest, if not the second highest, battle IQ in all of Hunter x Hunter, a lot of his strength can also be attributed to how versatile his Nen technique is, Bungie Gum. See, Hisoka is a transmuter, which allows him to transmute his Nen into having the properties of both Bungie and Gum, which means not only is it stretchy, but also sticky, meaning Hisoka can do things like attach his Nen to somebody's face and rip them towards it, or use his Nen to make a shield to stop projectiles, or even use his Nen to reattach severed limbs. But more than anything, the versatility of Bungie Gum allows Hisoka to leave incredibly intricate and well-laid traps, or even survive death. But outside of transmutation, Hisoka is also an incredibly well-accomplished conjurer, which is how he's able to use his second technique, Texture Surprise, where he can generate a sheet of something to match whatever he's laying it upon, which is how he's able to make it appear as though he's reattached a severed limb because he can generate a slab of lookalike skin and put it around the sever mark. But outside of his intellect and his Nen technique, Hisoka is also confirmed to be the third physically strongest member of the Phantom Troop. And mind you, he might actually be stronger than that, but he wasn't interested to keep going, which means that Hisoka's attack potency is somewhere on the level of Finks and Ugovit, or at the very least, greater than Bonalanov, who was able to, with the use of his technique, recreate Jupiter and throw it at you. Though it's not actually the size of Jupiter, that would be ridiculous. Which means that Hisoka's attack potency is placed somewhere between multi-city block and small town level. We've already touched on what we believe his speed to be, high hypersonic plus. We know this because he was able to speed blitz the likes of Gon and Goto, who was the strongest out of all of the butlers of the Zoldic family. He can also keep up in speed with all of the Zoldics and the strongest of the Phantom Troop member. And with stamina that allows him to catch a ball that was launched with Gon's rock and redirected by Razor, and even take blows from Krolo, who's able to decapitate people with a singular chop with next to no damage, his durability is also hypothesized to be small town level. So while he may be a bad guy, he is coming in at number eight on our list. But don't worry, the list of ambiguously moral characters doesn't end there, because coming in at number seven, we have Spirit Allburn. Spirit Albarn is from Soul Eater, one of my favorite anime and manga of all time. He's the father of the main character of the story, Maka Alburn, and is death's number one death weapon, which is saying something when you consider the fact that death has like nine death weapons. Now, Spirit is a bit of an enigma on this list, because Spirit, while a pervert, 
is a successful one. See, Spirit, unlike Zenitsu, isn't a wannabe womanizer. He just straight up is. See, Spirit enjoys nothing more than being surrounded by women. And he does very well for himself. I mean, obviously, he has a child, but he also has an ex-wife, Maka's mother, who he cheated on with another woman. And while I'm not condoning cheating, it just means that he's able to get women. But Spirit definitely takes the womanizing further than is necessary. I mean, obviously, cheating is further than necessary, but he also only takes the attendance of female members of the Death Academy, which not only the students, but also other teachers of the Death Weapon Meister Academy find a bit revolting. On top of this, even though Spirit seems remorse about cheating on Maka's mother and says that he still loves her, nobody really believes it. Because even though he's frequently guilty about what womanizing has done to his life, he continues to womanize. However, even though he's perverse somewhat creep, he's also an incredible parent, going out of his way any chance he gets to support Maka. But outside of being a doting parent, Spirit is also probably the second strongest death weapon in the universe, with only Excalibur, which is claimed to be the strongest weapon in the universe, being stronger than him. But since Spirit is able to match Death's wavelength and amplify it, and Death is literally the god of the Soul Eater universe, he is considered the strongest weapon outside of Excalibur, which makes him stronger than both Ragnarok and Soul Eater, the person the manga is named after. And his durability and sharpness is so great that he was able to cut through Krona's black blood. And he was able to withstand a unique form of resonance from Ragnarok when Ragnarok used Scream Resonance. Not to mention that his stamina and strength is at such a level that he was once able to hike to the moon. So while technically he may need death to reach his full power, I'm still putting him relatively high on this list because his durability and stamina are absolutely no joke. But enough about people you probably don't know, let's get back to some people you definitely do. Because coming in at number six, we have Jiraiya. Jiraiya is the exact example of a character who can have some bad qualities, but is overall widely beloved. A character who may not be perfect, but is also probably the vast majority of a fan base's favorite character. And for good reason with Jiraiya. While there are definitely parts of his personality that are terrible. The overall weight of the goodness of his soul definitely outweighs the bad. Jiraiya also falls into the same categorization of spirit, however. See, while Jiraiya might be a lecherous lewd who tells Naruto to transform into his sexy technique so he can stare at the body of technically a 13-year-old boy, he also does relatively well with women. In fact, I think canonically, Jiraiya has had two separate freeways in Naruto, which is weird because he usually spends the majority of his time peeping into bathhouses or any other situation where a woman might be undressing. And yet he has the ability to bag pretty much every woman we've ever seen him come across, which when you consider the fact that he's 6'4", ripped and rich, kind of makes sense. Now, obviously, Jiraiya does this all under the guise of research for his books, which is the wildly popular four-book series, Ichi Icha, which is Ichi Icha Paradise, each each of violence, each each incidents, and each each of tactics. And these books and the hundreds of S tier missions he's done have made Jiraiya a very rich man. But outside of being incredibly rich, Jiraiya is also one of the most powerful characters in the Naruto universe. He was hailed as one of the greatest ninja of his generation and one of the strongest that Konoha ever produced. One of the legendary Sanin, fought in the Second and Great Shinobi World Wars, battled against Hanzo the Salamander, trained Naruto, mastered Toad Sage Mode, and maybe more impressively than anything, defeated four out of the six paths of pain with no prior knowledge on how they operated. When it comes to power acquired through regular means, Jiraiya is one of the strongest in Naruto's history. And everything that we've seen from him is actually barely scratching the surface of what we know about his strength. See, while what we see about Jiraiya proves him to be one of the strongest people we've ever seen in Naruto, the claims of his strength are even more insane. See, when Itachi and Kisame came to Konoha after Hiruzen's death, technically to warn Danzo that Itachi was still out there and that he shouldn't touch Sasuke, Itachi and Kisame recognized that if they were to battle against Jiraiya, that massive losses would be incurred by both sides and that they would still probably lose, which in itself is an insane statement. Those are the third and fourth most powerful people in the entirety of the Akatsuki. Kisame was referred to as the tailless tail beast and Itachi killed the entire Uchiha clan. And there's a reason that Jiraiya was offered to become the Hokage four separate times. And more than that, Nagato believed that if Jiraiya had a prior understanding of how the Six Paths of Pain worked, he would have lost to it. And honestly, everything that we see from Jiraiya backs up these points. See, Jiraiya's durability has been shown on a level where he can take attacks from summons as large as Gamabunta, as well as being able to kick back the heads of the multi-headed dogs that Nagato was able to summon. Jiraiya had technically only ever been brought to the brink of death twice before, you know, his death. And one was when Naruto unleashed four tails in his version to cloak and the others when 
he got peeping on Tsunade. But in both of those circumstances, Jiraiya was actively trying to not kill the person attacking him, which speaks to an even higher level of durability. On top of this, when Jiraiya decided to use his Sage Mode, he could perfect it as he was in Imperfect Sage Mode by fusing with Ma and Pa, two toad sages from Mount Mumbuka, who would be able to collect nature energy and turn it into Senjutsu energy and funnel into his body for him, making him one of the most versatile sages in all of Naruto. Jiraiya's attack potency is said to be city level plus, as with the power of a sage boosted Big Ball Rasengan, he would be able to inflict massive amounts of damage to basically anybody he came across. In fact, Jiraiya was said to be on par with Orochimaru, and that's proven by the fact that Jiraiya was able to pierce Orochimaru with his needle Jizu. On top of that, speed wise, he's considered to be massively hypersonic plus, as he should be faster than Kisame, he was able to defeat Konon, and he was on multiple occasions able to speed blitz members of the Six Paths of Pain. And since it was stated that all of the legendary Sanin should be able to defeat each other, that makes him definitively comparable to Orochimaru, whose AP and striking ability is island level. So all in all, don't mess with an author with a bunch of money in their pocket. You know who you definitely don't want to mess with? Somebody who enjoys that author's books, because coming in at number five, we have Kakashi. See, while I will admit adding Kakashi onto a list of well-known perverts is kind of a stretch, let's not forget that the Ichiichi books are glorified corn. Sure, there's some romance in them and all of that, but at the end of the day, there's a reason that Kakashi is reading it. And he's reading these books around children that he's supposed to be teaching. So while he may not be the worst offender on this list by far, especially when we consider the fact that these children ask to see what he's reading, and multiple times he rejects them, though when they do grow up, he does actually technically lend them the books, going so far as to lend one of them to Sasuke to help improve his game and understand Sakura better, and giving one to Naruto to help him better understand women, and also probably better understand Jiraiya. A big one just pulled up but he doesn't like sitting in my lap he's also too big it's also very hard to move with this dog in my lap so whether or not you believe that kakashi actually deserves to be on this list i'll leave it up to you he's definitely not the worst offender we've ever seen but he goes a bit further than i would so i'm putting him on the list however when it comes down to strength kakashi definitely deserves to be where he's at on this list see kakashi's strength is no joke in his dms form he's top five strongest characters in naruto ever, Boruto included. And obviously during the war, he had a myriad of feats that were ridiculously impressive, like showing a speed feat side by side with Minato that may have had him moving at roughly KCM2 Minato speeds, as he tried to close in on Black Zetsu before Black Zetsu could steal the Rinnegan from Obito, of which both Minato and Kakashi got to simultaneously. Using Kamui 18 separate times throughout the war, battled on par with one Rinnegan Obito, and the combined power of his Kamui and Obito's Kamui made an event that was similar to the Ten Tails cat and after he acquired his dual MS and unlocked his Susano, where he was able to use things like Kamui Shuriken, he was able to speed blitz the likes of Kaguya, who is confirmed light speed character, meaning that Kakashi is faster than light, which is confirmed by the fact that he can keep up with Sixth Gate Guy, KCM2 Minato, and KCM Naruto. And with the power of his Rai Carrier Purple Lightning, people hypothesize his AP is somewhere around island level. And considering the fact that he was able to generate a mud wall that was able to stop a shuriken from Obito that could injure Kiyuki, his durability is also said to be somewhere around island level, which is even further backed up by the fact that he was able to withstand a tail strike from a version 2 Jinchuriki cloak, something that almost killed Jiraiya. And what's crazier than all of that? Well, obviously his dual MS state was his strongest ever. Kakashi is actually said to be stronger than he was in the war arc in his light novel because he no longer has to worry about the chakra drain of his Sharingan, being able to make maintain a lightning resistant mud wall around an entire village for 12 hours, showing that Kakashi's chakra pool is one of the largest in Naruto, but also being able to use all 1000 jutsus he copied with the Sharingan he no longer has. So current estimations of his AP, DP, stamina, durability, and all of that might actually be a little low, as this light novel is still relatively new and not a lot of people read light novels. But enough about Kakashi, let's talk about people who are out there still getting very public feats. Kakashi is still getting very public feats. I mean, he traded hands with Kashin Koji, who decided he was too much of a threat to battle against, and Kashin Koji killed a 10% Jigen, who, let's not forget, absolutely embarrassed Naruto and Sasuke. Though that was only a 10% Jigen, so the scaling on it is a bit weird. Moving on to our number four spot, with somebody who is still out there getting very public feats, we have Sanji. Listen, I technically am only in Zo, but I know that Sanji is probably stronger than Kakashi and Jiraiya. And also, I know what happens in the manga. One Piece fans love spoiling things. Like, I don't know all the details, but I know a good amount. Now, Sanji, while a lot of people believe that his perviness is endearing or not all that bad, definitely deserves to be on this list. See, while Sanji might try to throw a disguise over his perviness under the guise of it being chivalry or something like that, he is a man who throws himself at any woman who either does or doesn't look at him. Whether that be 16-year-old princesses from Fishman Island, 
older 30 some year old princess is from Dressrosa it doesn't matter if you're not a man there's a good chance that Sanji is going to hurl himself at you and that is not only the case for princesses of whatever age but also crewmates and while there are plenty of ways to hit on women throwing yourself at them physically and trying to get as much of them in your arms as possible definitely not the way now sure is Sanji probably playing the long game with the likes of Nami making sure that she's well treated and fed on the ship at all times sure but Sanji acted so lewdly on Fishman Island that there is a going joke in the one piece community that Sanji wasn't even there to begin with because we have to ignore it to keep our sanity he after all was 19 and she was 16 that's illegal top of all of this during the thriller bark arc he expressed multiple times how he wanted invisibility because he would use it to peep on women and this is the reason that he hates Absalom because Absalom is the reason that he couldn't gain invisibility because Absalom had already eaten the Sukasuki no Mi now in terms of abilities Sanji loves to kick he hasn't consumed a devil fruit however he does have the ability to generate enough kinetic energy on his legs by spinning in order to light his legs on fire increasing the attack power of his kicks and because of his devastating and well-known power he's considered a part of the monster trio which is Luffy Zoro and him on top of all of this Sanji is also a very proficient wielder of hockey specifically observation hockey because during his stay in the Kamabaka kingdom Sanji had to keep a constant lookout for members of the Kamabaka kingdom who were coming to steal his manhood and thus he had learned how to see these incoming enemies without actually physically seeing them and we've seen him use this observation hockey multiple times like when he's able to sense caribou in the Ryugu palace during the Fishman Island arc or help Kinemon recover his torso from the lake in Punk Hazard or maybe most impressively in Dressrosa when he was able to determine that there was a sniper 16 meters from him and intercept the sniper shot before he was able to pull the trigger on top of this after battling against Alexis CP9 Sanji figured out how to use Skywalk by kicking the air with such a level of strength that he's able to push the air in order to walk in the sky now technically has Sanji done anything that would make me believe currently in what I've seen in One Piece that he would be stronger than Kakashi or Jiraiya no he's not in Dressrosa I haven't made it to the final fight of Zoe there's nobody in Fishman Island or Punk Hazard notable enough for Sanji to have defeated for me to be like oh wow true strength and genuinely the last important fight I feel like he was in was in Ennis Lobby where Diablo Jambe is revealed in the first place as he was able to defeat Jabra with relative ease outside of that the most impressive thing I've seen Sanji do thus far is withstanding a massive strike of lightning from a nail but scaling websites seem to think that he's multi-continent plus and faster than light which is insane to me but I have no evidence to prove it otherwise and I haven't seen everything so I, I guess Sanji's at four but let's get back to some of the things that I have seen everything of because coming in at number three we have Meliodas because back in 2020 before I really started making content I had worse taste in manga and that's when Seven Deadly Sins was coming to its conclusion and back in those days I had no real problem with the manga revolving around a pervert who reincarnated and kept finding his infant wife over thousands of years until eventually Eventually, he could raise her to be old enough to like legally date him and other things like that but that's seven deadly sins for you and I've read every chapter so you bet your sweet behind that Meliodas is making it at number three on this list now Meliodas to me is a character that I grew up with the manga ran for about eight years it started in 2012 ended in 2020 and 2012 is just about when I started my true love for anime and manga and thus seven deadly sins was one of the first things that I really read and engaged with and because I was young when I started seven deadly sins I related to Meliodas I was also so horny but as I grew and I formed a fully formed brain I began to realize Meliodas is the worst thing about seven deadly sins that and Bond's Lolly Bride. Do all Seven Deadly Sins had incredible moments, fantastic fights, a really cool power system, a rich and diverse universe? The fact that I had to see this entire world through the eyes of a man who would fully grope a underage girl every time he saw her, but hey, it's fine because they've been reincarnated to be with each other for thousands of years, kind of took me out of the experience as a whole. But pervert or not, likable or not, Meliodas's strength is undeniable especially by the end of the manga which I don't know if the anime actually even ever touched because the anime after season two is it's literally unwatchable and the movies somehow worse see Meliodas goes through a lot of forms well they may not be like forms per se but they're different iterations of Meliodas and then there is some definitely forms in there as well see Meliodas is cursed with immortality and every single time that he dies his soul goes into purgatory where the king of hell eats a little bit of his emotions and then sends him back about after a month which makes Meliodas stronger every single time until eventually Meliodas can make his way back to being one of the strongest if not the strongest person in his own universe and by the end of the manga 
he's there. In battles like his battle against Demon Tristan or Arthur, we truly begin to understand how strong this final version of Meliodas is. Now, mind you, these final battles that I'm talking about come from the Four Nights of the Apocalypse, which is the sequel series to The Seven Deadly Sins, which I watch YouTubers explain because uh, part of me needs to know what's going on. Truly, the highest form of Meliodas' power comes from a little thing known as Assault Mode. This is what happens when Meliodas releases his demon power to the highest level of extent. And in fact, according to Meliskula, back when Meliodas was a member of the Ten Commandments, every single one of them was afraid that he would use this technique against them. Because when he enters this technique, even though it gives him massive power, it robs him of all emotions and feelings. Meaning he simply becomes the strongest version of himself, devoid of any thoughts or emotions. Just a singular use killing machine. And after Meliodas enters this assault mode, his power level becomes 142,000, which when you consider the fact that his power level at the beginning of the series is 3,370, it's kind of scary. Basically 50 times stronger. And that 50 times stronger makes a lot of sense when you look at what's happening in the Four Nights of the Apocalypse, as things like his Trillian Dark were able to inflict damage against Arthur and casually blitz a demon Tristan who was said to be stronger than Demon King Zeldris, who Demon King Meliodas was able to stomp. All in all, people estimate that Meliodas' attack potency is somewhere around multi-continent plus, and with feats like being able to blitz Demon Tristan, putting him in the faster than light category. On top of this, since we've casually in a battle against Arthur, seen him blow away entire mountains while not aiming at the mountain, people estimate that his striking power is somewhere around large country to continent. And considering the fact that when Meliodas was in his Demon King form, he was able to withstand multiple attacks from Demon King Zeldris, it's pretty easy to say that his durability is somewhere on the continent level. Tie all that into the fact that he's technically a mortal and you have a pretty scary character. But being scary isn't always all it's cracked up to be because sometimes power isn't associated with fear. Sometimes power is associated with being a giant yellow octopus who's trying to teach a room of kids how to kill him. Because coming in at number two, we have Koro Sensei. Now listen, listen, I can hear you screaming through your screen. Koro Sensei isn't nearly as strong as Meliodas or Kakashi or even Jiraiya. In fact, Koro Sensei probably should be right down there with Zenitsu. So how on God's green earth is Koro Sensei this high on the list. See, while Koro Sensei might scale somewhere similar to Zenitsu, he differs in one key way. See, Koro Sensei is from Assassination Classroom. He's a former assassin who gets turned into a tentacle matter through human experimentation. Essentially, humans find a way to incorporate antimatter into a human's body, which gives them superhuman abilities. However, it also puts a timer on their life. You see, they learn in Assassination Classroom that the amount of antimatter you put in somebody's body is proportional to the amount of time it's gonna take them to explode, which is why when a mouse is incorporated with antimatter on the moon, because it's so small, it pretty much explodes immediately. And the explosion from that mouse incorporated with antimatter is enough to destroy 70% of the moon. Koro Sensei is three meters tall, which means technically he has way more antimatter than the mouse does. But that does mean that when he explodes, the explosion will be much larger, though it will be later. And thus, after Koro Sensei is created, it's deduced that there will be 365 days until he explodes and destroys the earth. So sure, while Koro Sensei technically is only capable of traveling Mach 20, and he's probably building level at best, if we extrapolate that a mouse is enough to destroy 70% of the moon, that means it would only take about one and a half mice to destroy the entirety of the moon. And since the Earth is only about four times bigger than the moon, that means it would only take about six mice to destroy the Earth. And considering the fact that Koro Sensei is three meters tall, that's over nine feet, he has the mass of hundreds, if not thousands of mice. Which means not only is Koro Sensei's body big enough to destroy things like the Earth, he's big enough to destroy things like the Sun, which is only 109 times bigger than the Earth. Its diameter is 109 times bigger. And therefore about 1.3 million Earths could fit inside the Sun. And whether or not you attribute Koro Sensei's eventual explosion to him or not, I do. And thus while Koro Sensei, while alive, is definitely weaker than almost everybody else on this list, his death poses a much larger threat. And it's not like Koro Sensei isn't dangerous. While he was a human, he was considered the world's best assassin. And it's actually implied in Assassination Classroom that Koro Sensei in his tentacle monster form is able to wipe out cities. He can travel Mach 20 and is fast enough to leave physical after images that can teach every single member of Class 3E simultaneously. Like when he was cheering for each individual member of Class 3E simultaneously during sports day. On top of this, Koro Sensei's durability is no joke, which puts his durability at, at least 
city level. Not to mention the Koro Sensei also has the ability to molt and regenerate, making him borderline unkillable. But enough about his power, why is he on this list of perviest characters? Well, one side effect of Koro Sensei's experimentation meant that he was unable to hide his hidden feelings. Meaning anybody who he found attractive or anybody he wanted to get to know on more than just the personal level, he told. Basically, he was unable to lie. Because of this, it's not like Koro Sensei is overtly pervy. He's not worse than any single one of us. He's just not able to hide the parts of him the rest of us hide. The thoughts that go through our head when we see somebody we find attractive, we get to keep to ourselves. He, on the other hand, has to speak them out loud. But this is a side effect of his experimentation because his experimentation made him into somebody some people would perceive to be weak. And a big part of that weakness the Reaper identified was the world understanding who he was. And therefore, without the ability to hide his true feelings, he would be an open book. And in that sense, the exact opposite of the assassin that he was in his previous life, a close, cold, and calculated human being, perfect for killing others. Sorry, my dogs are playing in the background, as you can see. I run a pit bull fighting ring. The only reason I'm letting them do this inside is because this entire room is boxes. I don't care what they bump into. However, Koro Sensei's perviness wasn't always the worst thing, as it actually allowed him to get along with some of his students better, most specifically Okajima, who was also a pervert. But perversion doesn't always come in handy, and in fact, it's usually a large detriment to a person's character. And in no person in anime is that more evident than our number one entry on this list. Possibly the most perverted yet strongest person on this list. So whether or not this list was going to come down to power or perversion, this character was going to be at number one. Because coming in at number one is the archetype, the blueprint for a perverted character that's beloved by all, Master Roshi. Master Roshi is a Dragon Ball character that's been with us since the 80s. A truly iconic man who created the Kamehameha wave and taught it to Goku. But just as iconic as his martial arts or his Kamehameha wave is Master Roshi's perversion. See, Master Roshi is an over 300 year old man who enjoys two things, women, and delivered pizza. But when Master Roshi isn't eating pizza or training in the martial arts, he, he's looking at corn. Master Roshi has internet out on his little island in the middle of the ocean. However, all he uses that internet for is exactly what you would anticipate he uses that internet for. But during the day, he switches it up because he just watches wide thighs aerobics, which is an 80s workout class with women and unitards and leg warmers. But if he ever feels like taking it a bit more old school, he just reads Dirty Magazine. And this is mostly because Master Roshi is down horrendously. So bad that in the early parts of the Dragon Ball series, he trades a Dragon Ball. The thing that if you get seven of them, you literally get to wish for whatever you want to see her panties. That's it just the look. But his advances don't just stop with Bulma. Any attractive woman that Master Roshi can get around, he makes advances on. Bulma, Launch, Chi Chi, Android 18, all of them. If you're a woman, fair chance Master Roshi's hitting on you. But as perverted as Master Roshi is, he is equally powerful. Even in the early days of Dragon Ball, back in the 80s, Master Roshi used the Kamehameha wave to destroy the moon, a level of feat that nobody else on this list could achieve. And while many assumed that for the last 40 years, Master Roshi was just off in his shack getting weaker, it's actually revealed in Super that Master Roshi has been committed to keeping himself fit, as it was shown that Master Roshi was capable of defeating Frieza's soldiers. And in Super, when Master Roshi was being brainwashed and he was devoid of all morals, he was able to defeat Tien. Meanwhile, in the early days of Dragon Ball, Master Roshi was able to catch bullets. His Kamehameha wave, which we can only assume travels at the speed at which he's able to travel, was able to reach the moon in sub-relativistic speeds. However, the most impressive thing is that Master Roshi in Super is able to keep up with and even outpace numerous fighters in the Tournament of Power, meaning that his speed in Super is massively faster than Light Plus. And since we're talking about Super, let's talk about Super. Master Roshi also in Super threw mitts with a base Goku, which may not sound like a lot, but comparatively to everybody else on this list, that is a lot. When you tie that into the fact that his range is at least from the earth to the moon with his key blast, you have a man who's massively faster than light, has the AP of at least planet level, and has a range of hundreds, if not thousands of miles with his key blast. Actually, hundreds of thousands of miles. The moon is 238,000 miles from the earth. Feels far, doesn't it? Whether it be perversion or power, Master Roshi is coming out on top. But what do you guys think? Is there anybody who didn't make the list that you would have loved to see on here? Tell me in the comments below and why it goes down there, please, for me. Like this video, subscribe to the page, hit that noti bell. I feel like the only time I ever talk about Dragon Ball is when I make these kinds of like multiple different animes ranked in one video. And I feel like eventually 
I'm just gonna start making Dragon Ball content and I am not excited for that because I am not caught up with Super.